been with ILM for uh, quite a while now, but I'm curious, you know, the Jurassic World franchise launched in 2015. Um, but I, in my research, I really only found credits for you for Fallen Kingdom in this one. Were you involved at all in the first Jurassic World? Not in the first Jurassic World. No, this, um, my first foray into the dinosaur, into the land of dinosaurs was Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. And then I did Battle of Big Rock, mm -hmm. which I'm sure as a fan you've seen. And then, uh, Jurassic World Dominion. So it's been five years of my life spent with dinosaurs, which has been wonderful. What have been some of the, uh, the 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 biggest challenges for you really exploring this this dinosaur world mixed with the modern day? You know what the biggest challenge is? <clears throat> I there's many challenges in um, breathing life into dinosaurs. And I think there's a sort of weight of responsibility that I feel on my shoulders as well in, in paying a sort of service to the fans who are so passionate about the film and know such a huge amount about dinosaurs but also you know walking in the footsteps of legends like Dennis Muren and Phil Tippett who you know made the industry our industry of visual effects what it is and you know kicked started this whole thing with Jurassic Park that's that's quite a thing to to grow up um you know as a young man seeing Jurassic Park and being completely blown away by it and then to become part of that legacy it feels kind of crazy to even say that out loud if I'm honest you know so that's a big thing for me but then actually technically Jurassic World Dominion <clears throat> really pushed the envelope in terms of feathers that's a huge creative and technical challenge that we had set before us on the film but also just trying to realize these creatures in so many different environments in snow and ice and in the forest and in um you know in the hot desert in the hot sun of Malta and in really urban environments, as well as the sort of traditional jungle environments that we're used to seeing in it. So that was actually going to lead into one of my next questions was going to be the environments, because, I mean, this is easily the most diverse uh, range of locations we've seen in the franchise yet. Was there any particular uh, setting that you found the most challenging to work with? I mean, the the one of the biggest challenges we had from an environment's perspective was bias in valley and <clears throat> this was a massive puzzle that we pieced together from a number of different locations around the world we were in um in vancouver uh near vancouver island and in parts of squamish uh, where we referenced a lot of the forest line from from that area for the sort of the the basin and the bowl of bias in valley itself but we also went to the Swiss Alps <clears throat> and we scanned a dam at Grand, Grand Exence Dam, which is this huge dam which freezes over every winter. We scanned that and we scanned a whole bunch of the mountains around it. We went to the Dolomites and flew helicopters around the Dolomites and scanned those. And <clears throat> then this was just a massive puzzle that we had to the piece, the digital bits of this environment back together and combine it with the physical sets that Kev Jenkins and his team built to create a digital version of Bias in Valley. So it's all been sourced from real locations and real places and then pieced back together. But Bias in ended up being a fully digital creation that we could go to any piece of it, whether it was the ice lake or whether it was down in the, in the actual valley itself where some of the scenes take place. Well, it comes together really well. Uh, I, I, it, it flows very seamlessly. So uh, kudos to you on that. Um, and so uh, with this one, we saw Colin Trevorrow return to the director's chair over uh, J.A. Bayona on the last film. And so I'm curious what that's like for you, you know, working with two different filmmakers, but still being set in the same universe. You know, what? working with different directors is <clears throat> something you get very used to as a visual effects supervisor, but it's very rare that you get to work on the same franchise with two different directors. And J.A. Bayona and Colin Trevorrow have very different styles aesthetically. You know, Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom had an aspect ratio of, of 235, it's, you know, widescreen. And Jurassic World Dominion went back to the two to one aspect ratio that Colin Trevorrow invented for... Jurassic the first Jurassic World so even just from a sort of aspect ratio of the film you know our goals change and that changes how you fit a dinosaur in the frame and how you compose every single shot um <clears throat> but I I was very used to working with Colin because he was he wrote the script on Fallen Kingdom 
he and I collaborated and he directed uh, Battle of Big Rock behind me. And um, <clears throat> so I, I, I'd spent a lot of time with him on set through Fallen Kingdom. I knew how he worked. He knew what I did. Um, he kind of interviewed me as a supervisor on Dominion, on ba Big Rock in many ways. And we, we get them really well together. So Colin's such a good collaborator. He, he really is good at, at using the heads of department and the creatives around him to inspire and bring him ideas. And he's really decisive as well as a director. He, he knows what he wants and he tells you, um, but he's open to suggestions for other ideas. So really good fun collaborating with him on this one. Well, that's always awesome to hear uh, having that collaborative process behind the scenes. Uh, and so with that said, then what would you say were uh, your two like you and Colin's biggest goals uh, coming into this film in comparison to Big Rock and Fallen Kingdom? You know what? That that's a great question as well. And the the big goals that I could see that Colin was laying down in front of us for this film were to truly understand what it would be like if dinosaurs existed in our world. And that was the that was the big pitch. It was what happens if humans and dinosaurs interact and what what is that what does that look like and so seeing creatures in as many different types of environment as we could whether it be the sort of snowy um <clears throat> forests that we see blue and beta running through or the apatosaurs in at the lumberyard or the hot malta sun and so that was a massive challenge <clears throat> and it was a massive kind of directive that colin had for us as going into the film um, I think one of the other ones was um, not not sort of correcting the sins of the previous films because not having feathers on dinosaurs in Jurassic Park and Jurassic World was because science didn't believe that dinosaurs had feathers at the time that those movies were created. So the characters had been established. But to try to sort of give back to the fan base and establish that, okay, we can have feathers in a Jurassic franchise and that's something that people have been crying out for for a long time. And that's kind of the reason that the Dilophosaurus came back, because the fans wanted to see the Dilophosaurus. So it, Colin wanted to give back all of the love and time that people have poured into the franchise by going to see it and supporting it. Colin wanted to give back. So as a fan of the franchise yourself, as you were kind of mentioning earlier, I'm curious if there was any particular dinosaur whether it be uh the dilophosaurus or any of the other roster of uh dinosaurs that are in this film that you were most excited to help bring to life uh when you joined the franchise that's an easy one the, for me the the best dinosaur in the franchise is the, at the moment anyway is the therizinosaurus such an amazing creature and you know if you look at a concept of the therizinosaurus it's seven meters tall kind of like an ostrich got a massive beak meter long baseball claws and and feathers all over it and it doesn't look real and you don't understand how a creature like that could have existed it's so bizarre but the process of sort of breathing life into that in visual effects was really it was a labor of love and you know the <clears throat> working on the digital feathers we built a new a new feather system at ilm in houdini which allowed us to procedurally generate all of the feathers on the creatures and then it gave the artist the ability to simulate feather and wind and water and snow and ice and, and bring all of those simulations into the same piece of software so that they could all interact with each other beautifully. Lent a layer of reality and believability to those simulations that um, is why the shots look so fantastic and is testament to the fantastic artists at ILM that pulled that off. But it's my favorite creature. It was really quite the wild creature to to see on the screen. And and like you said, it's one that I can't imagine being real, but at the same time, who knows? I mean, it it feel I feel like it you guys must have come pretty close. Oh uh, tension in the scene as well. It was it was beautifully directed and acted by Colin and Bryce. But the animators at ILM did such a fantastic job of selling the tension and the poise and the slow movement, the slow creeping movement of the Therizinosaurus in that scene is really a testament to their great work. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and, and so I know that this film was made, you know, during the, the COVID pandemic, and we've heard uh, from a lot of studios about the uh, issues as far as 
you know, vis working on visual effects from home and such during such a time. What was that like for you and your team having to, you know, put this this massive film together during this kind of hectic time in the world? I mean, <clears throat> the pandemic had a number of effects on us, really, in that we've been shooting for three or four weeks and then we got locked down and nobody could film and we we stopped. Um, but visual effects actually carried on. We pivoted within a space of about 48 hours. ILM pivoted the entire team to be able to work from home securely. And we carried on. And we were working on the post viz, which is taking the plates that we'd already shot and putting temporary versions of dinosaurs into those so that editorially it could tell the story. And Colin could commit to an edit that he could then turn over to us to do the visual effects work on. But it also it had another effect in that <clears throat> we had massive sequences that were staged outside of the UK, the sequence in Malta, for example, where we suddenly decided not to send our main unit to Malta at all. So Bryce and Chris never went to Malta. So we had to pivot and understand how, from a visual effects perspective, we could integrate them into second unit photography shot in Malta and make us make the audience believe that they actually went to that location. We had to shoot multiple array plates, um, tracking vehicles running down streets with three or four cameras on capturing background plates for us. We scanned huge swathes of Valletta city streets digitally so that we could rebuild them in, in post-production and insert plates of Chris and Bryce on green screen into those, into those shots to create the seamless effect that they actually went to Malta and, and filmed there. Wow. Well, again, uh, totally believable. I, I would have thought they went. So that's, uh, that's Good. great work. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have ruined the surprise. <laughs> oh, no, that's, that's always that always comes from learning about the the behind the scenes, you, you yeah. learn a little bit too much. But at the same time, it's really cool to hear how it comes together. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, Obviously, critics were a little more divided on the film, but audiences have remained very positive on this film. What was it like for you seeing, you know, the two spectrums of response to Dominion when it came out? I mean, <clears throat> it, it's always disappointing when critics' expectations of a film don't meet the reality of what they see. But do you know what? What I really care about is that I went and enjoyed the movie and hundreds of millions of other people have also gone and enjoyed the movie and the box office speaks volumes. People really love this film and it's such a great roller coaster of a movie. Um, <clears throat> I think the visual effects have done a lot more than just supported the film. They, you know, crafted a wonderful, um, <clears throat> a wonderful piece of, of film history. And I'm very proud to be a part of it. So with a film like this as well, when it gets, you know, put into the spotlight, uh, I remember when the trailers were first coming out, there was the guy on the scooter scene that just became a frequent meme. And I'm curious if you were aware of that or what you thought of that becoming a, a kind of meme. I don't, you know what, I don't, th I think that missed me by the meme, I, <laughs> the guy on the scooter, because he, the, the guy on the scooter is a comp the competition win again. He, he won a competition to be eaten by a dinosaur. And <clears throat> I think in pre-production, Chris had announced this competition and everybody entered and, and this guy won. So my kind of memory of that whole thing is that we got lump, lumped with this idea that suddenly we were creating some sort of composite to get a guy from America who'd won a competition into a plate that was in Malta. And we had to work out how we could put that all together with visual effects. <laughs> so the scooter meme thing missed me. I have to look it up now then. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh yeah, it it was certainly a moment that uh caught me off guard and I think it's it's one that uh it it's become both good within its context and good outside of it. <laughs> you know what these movies are so it's just about having fun, isn't it? And it was such, it's such a fun moment, so unexpected and it's it's you know Without that comic element, that slightly comic element to these films, they would be terrifying. <laughs> they would be horror movies, yeah? And you need the sort of comic side of any Jurassic film, or it does just become Predator. <laughs> it's just people <laughs> being eaten by animals, which is pretty scary when you think about it. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. That that balance of tones is very important in this franchise. Yeah. Um, now, before I let you go, you are also... Uh, 
coming up on Avatar 2, which is pretty exciting. And so, uh, you know, again, that was one that you weren't involved in the first one, but you now are the VFX supervisor for the second. What's that been like for you, that experience coming into this, you know, hugely anticipated thing? I'm only working on, well, I am working on a portion of the film. We're not, I'm certainly not the visual effects supervisor. I am one of the supervisors. I am a super ILM. And um, <clears throat> that's a pretty exciting thing to be part of, I've got to say. You know, I, Avatar broke fresh ground in the world of visual effects and filmmaking, and as Jurassic did in its time. And so I'm very excited to be part of this second one. Can you give me any kind of tease of how of what we can expect uh, in terms of comparing it to the first one? I'd get fired if I did. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's plenty good yeah. right there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, well, all right, David, thank you so much for taking the time to chat. I really appreciate it. That's all the questions I really had. And uh, I'm looking forward to oops, that shoulder uh, oh, <laughs> diving yeah, well, I saw into, that. into the Blu-ray when I can. So There's uh, a lot I of hope good you stuff have... on that Blu-ray. I I can imagine. I mean, I, I the extended edition alone caught my eye, let alone all the awesome special features. So thank you again so much. I, I greatly appreciate it. No pleasure. Thank you.